Um, I was blessed to sit in with the youth a little bit this morning as Diane and Isaac were preparing the message, and, and they are talking about forgiveness and loving their enemies this morning, and, and so they're learning to see things differently too. And uh, that's what it means to walk with Jesus and to follow him, is that we get to start to begin to see things the way that he sees them. And so we've come into this part of the discussion today um, about the kingdom of God. It, the, the part that we're walking into this morning is about worry. And I, that's how I felt. <laughs> like, like, like I, I am, I, have, I think that I, like probably more than most people, I'm a worrier. I, I see hurdles, not, not roads, right? Like, like, like when somebody says, we want to accomplish this, okay, I'm, I'm like, here's all the things that we're going to have to overcome to get there. That's, the, that's how I see. And so, you know, I, it's been already this journey in my life to, to lay those worries down. And it's hard. But I think worry is something that we can all relate with, right? We carry these burdens around with us in our lives. And, and when I was reading this scripture that I've read a whole lot, God shined a different light on this this morning that was interesting to me. And so I want to share that, that with you. Um, our passage today starts in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. So I want to read the first verse of that, and then we're going to, to take a pause. And Lord, I just, before we begin to read your word this morning, pray that you would just speak to our hearts, open our eyes, uh, give us something to take with us this morning, Lord, and that we can apply to our lives. In Jesus' name. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? So he so starts talking about provisions, the food and the and the clothing, and later on talks about water, and these are basic human needs. We all need food and water and shelter and clothing to survive. Those are basic human needs. But before we dig into this part too deeply, I want to back up a bit because this, the scripture starts with the word therefore. So there's this whole other part of this thought that we're missing, and we want to back up and kind of catch what Jesus is saying. Uh, this, this passage that we just read was in response to what comes before it. And so I want to back up to verses 19 through 24. It says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And this is the verse I want to hone in on right now. It says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. No one can have two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And it says, so it says you can't serve two masters. You can't be devoted to two masters. You'll either be devoted to one and despise the other. And that makes sense, right? If you're trying, if you have these divided loyalties, it makes sense that you can't serve these two different causes in your life because what happens when those come into conflict with one another? So it makes sense. So we have this famous passage at the end that we've all heard. It says, you cannot serve both God and money. We've all heard that passage, right? That's a very popular one to talk about. And usually when we read this passage, we think of the, the contention that comes from when people try to chase after money and, and rich things and, and possessions, and they also try to chase after God, and the contention that comes when you're chasing after money and you're chasing after God. But read how this is written. We're going to go right into the next verse. It says, you cannot serve both God and money, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will wear, 
or what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. There's a connection between those two things. If we're worried about our finances and about our provision, about where we're going to get our next meal, that's another way of being in service to money or being in bondage to money. I say bondage here because sometimes when you're in service to someone, it's not because you want to be. If you have a tyrant that rules over your life, that's still a type of service, isn't it? And it's not because you want to have that over your life, but it's a type of being connected to and wrapped up in something. So how can we serve God effectively if we're also chasing money, but also how can you serve God effectively if you're living your life under the boot that is the tyrant of money? There's a, there's a contention there. If I tell you that being worried about your money and about your provision is the same as serving a master of money, you may say that that's not fair. That just because I have financial difficulties doesn't mean that I'm choosing to serve another master. But often the important point isn't the choice that we made or whether it was a right or wrong choice, but often it's just the reality of where we find ourselves. So if you get a flat tire on your car in a bad area of town, the important matter at the, that point is not, why did I get a flat tire? Right? The, the important point is, how do I get this tire changed and drive my car out of here? So sometimes the reality of just kind of where we find ourselves is more important than the decisions that we made to get there. And if you find yourself tied up with worry about your finances, that comes into contention with the freedom that God has provided you. So the important thing is to recognize where you are and to get free. So who are the masters in your life who call and you heed the call? What are the things that happen in your life that demand you carry a burden of worry and you obey that demand, causing, causing divided loyalties. So I want to read the rest of this uh, scripture in, about worry, verses 24 or 25. We'll read the rest of this and see what Jesus says about this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how your father clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall I, we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen? So Jesus instructs us here not to worry, right? He says, listen. Don't worry. And, and he says that we don't need to worry. So what's the basis of his instruction here? If you look in verse 26, it says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And verse 30 says, If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you? 
So the basis of Jesus' instruction here, when he says, listen, my little flock, don't worry. The basis is that God promises to take care of you. That you can trust him to take care of you. And then he adds this. He says, can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? So on top of it, on top of the fact that, that God promises to take care of us, does worrying do anything for us? It does stuff to us, right? <laughs> it, yeah, it probably shortens your life. I mean, when you're carrying around that burden, so worry doesn't, is, there's no value in it. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? So here's where your worry comes into conflict with, with your relationship with God. God, who is your master, has said that he will take care of you. That you can trust him. That there's a freedom in serving him that he's got you in his hands. The other master, your circumstances, has said that you're not going to have enough provision, whatever type of provision that is that you should be worried. And you cannot believe God and trust in him and believe the other master and heed his call and worry about something. Those come into conflict. So I wrote this this morning in big, bold, red letters because I felt like this was a fresh word that the Lord has given me. So I'm going to read this part. Remember that good relationship with God is not defined by performing well. A good relationship with God is defined by the freedom that you have to enter his presence. A good relationship with God is measured by the intimacy that you have with him. I say this because when we're t talking about worry, we're not talking about moral, moral failure. If you're carrying around worry in your life, we're not talking about the fact that you failed somehow to serve Jesus well, but rather the important matter is what this burden of worry does to your freedom of relationship with God. What effect is this burden that you're carrying around having on the freedoms that God's put you in and he's promised you? So again, it's not about the fact that I'm failing because I'm serving this other master. It's that there's this thing that I have a burden in my life that's preventing me from having full freedom in the promises that God's given me. So it's not important how you got the flat tire. It's just important that I want to have the full freedoms that God's given me. I want free of this burden that's in my life. Your ability to trust him. Because the simple fact is this. Worry is a manifestation of distrust in God. It can't be anything else. Now, I'm not saying this as judgment on anyone because I run up against this more than anybody here. I, I begin to worry about things. And when I take those things to God, anytime I take any kind of worry to him, every single time his response is the same. He asks me one question. Do you trust me? That's right. You've heard that too, huh? Yeah. So anytime I come to him with a prayer about worry, he says, do you trust me? And that puts me at a point of decision in my, in my day. I, I can't say, yes, Lord, I trust you, and then entertain that worry. Now, when I say entertain that worry, I'm not talking about the fact that if, if I just choose, yeah, I trust him, that that worry just goes away because it doesn't, right? That's a process. But, but I found that when I make the declaration of trust in God and say, yes, Lord, I trust you, that it's certainly there's a, something that happens in my life that helps that worry subside. But I'm talking about entertaining my worry. Am I, am, is there something that I say that I'm worried about and then I get together with my friends and love to talk about that thing or I love to discuss it, or I love to rehash it, or I bring it back up and talk about how worried I am about this. Because we love to do that sometimes, don't we? So we entertain that in our lives. It's a type of fun, kind of. 
So we entertain that worry. So we, we can't, when God brings me that point of decision, if I say, yes, Lord, I trust you, then I'm agreeing to give him that worry. I can't harbor both. I can't entertain both. And I'll tell you guys, I'll tell on myself a little bit that the things I find myself giving to him are often things that I gave to him before. Where, where I was worried about something and then God said, do you trust me a few weeks ago? And I said, yes, Lord, I trust you. And, and I give him that thing and I have freedom in that. And I experienced some weeks of freedom where I was able to give this thing to the Lord and walk in the freedom of trusting the Lord and not having to have that other master in my life. And then I find myself worrying about it because when I wasn't looking, I reached over and like took that back from him. Anybody, anybody else done that, right? Like, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm holding this again. And, and, and when he brings me to that point of decision, like, do you trust me? It, I recognize that I've had this conversation before with you about this very thing. Because the big one is our kids and our finances and our home and our marriages, right? And we begin to worry about these things and that worry in our life doesn't add anything to our life. And so we pray about it and he says, trust me with that. And so we, we learn to do that. I tell guys who are getting married, I say, you have to learn the same lessons three times. I'll give you an example. The first lesson we learn to trust God with our own well-being. That's a lesson that we have to learn. Like in our walk, as we're walking with him, we have to learn, I can trust God with my well-being. Okay? You have to learn it again when you get married, and it's ten times harder, because now you have to trust God with your wife's well-being. And then, you have kids. And it's the same lesson, but it's a hundred times harder to trust the Lord with your kids. But he begins to teach you that he's just as faithful with your kids as he was when it was just you. And when it was just you, that seemed hard, didn't it? But then when you have kids, you're like, me part was easy. Who cares about me? What about my kids, Lord? You know, do something for my kids. And so this, this a lot of times this, this thing where I'm, I have this other master I listen to and I begin to worry is really a tug of war with God a little bit. Where I say, yeah, I do want to give that back to you. And I experience that freedom. And then at some point, I let that worry overcome me again. I take that back. And God reminds me, you can trust me. And he's way more patient than I want him to be in those things. Because he waits till my worry drives me to him before he reminds me that he's supposed to be holding that thing. Jesus is calling us to trust him and to let go of our worry. And as for me, he's calling me to do that over and over again all the time. Joe, trust me. Let go of it. And he's faithful. And, he, and he's faithful to do a supernatural work in my life when I make the decision to do that. So what we're talking about we're talking about kingdom mentality. Kingdom thinking. And I, as I was reading this there's something that really stuck out to me that I was like, that's a change in my thinking that I really want to lay hold of. And there's something in this passage that just stuck out to me. And it's in verse 31 where it says, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. So picture the picture. There's this idea here about what you're keeping your eyes on. The comment about the pagans chase after those things. It's like the very purpose of their life is to, to catch those things. The food. What they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, they chase after. Like, like, if I could just catch those things. Their goal is to lay hold of them. But it says your heavenly father knows what you need. So God takes these things that people are chasing after and he makes them 
to seem almost inconsequential. Don't worry about that stuff. God knows that you need those things. Earlier in verse 25, Jesus said, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Food sustains us, right? We need food to live. Food is something that we have to eat in order to live. But food isn't the point of of living. Food allows us to live, but food is not the purpose of living. Food is a means to an end. Food keeps us alive so that we can live life. Think about how backwards it, it becomes when we take this means to live life and make it the purpose of that life. We do this with our jobs sometimes, don't we? We don't work for money. We work for quality of life. The attitude I tried to have when I was working was that I worked because God told me to work here. I needed that attitude sometimes to survive in my job. But, But the reality is anybody, whether you're a Christian or not, you work somewhere for quality of life. You work so that you can have a lifestyle for you and your family that's sustainable. You don't work for money. Money is a means to an end. So what happens when the idea of working becomes more important than the thing that it's supposed to to give you? What happens when uh, a father works 80 or 90 hours a week so that their kids can have stuff, but they don't have a father? What happens when we start chasing money in our jobs but then we find that the chasing of that money defeats the very purpose of having money. What happens if you make a bunch of money in your job, but you don't have any time to spend it? That's a problem, isn't it? So it's the same kind of principle is that that food is not the point. Isn't, Isn't living more than food? Isn't there something more to it? Isn't life more than food? I was talking to a, a, a teenager last night. I had a great conversation, and we, one of the things we talked about was Enoch. And I was talking about how my vision of Enoch, and if you guys don't know, Enoch is the guy in the Old Testament that had this great relationship with the Lord, and he walked with God, and, and he had this, this walking with God type relationship. And then it said that God, Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more, and God just took him. It's cool, right? So, so when I picture that, it doesn't say a lot about it, but when I picture that, Um, I think about the things that they talked about. And when Enoch was walking with God, I don't think that Enoch's conversation was centered around, hey, God, it's good to see you again today. I'm kind of late on my rent payment. I'm having a hard time paying my bills. Um, I'm having some conflict with my neighbor. If you could just answer these requests from me. Are those things real things that he needs in his life? Yeah, yeah. But I like to think that that special walking with God relationship got past the, the, the consequential things. And I think that really intimate relationship with God begins with the inconsequential things. When you begin to just know that God's going to have you in that stuff. Just like Jesus says, his Father knows what you need. That, that you begin to realize that God's got that. And I like to think that his, his conversation with Enoch was like, Hey, Enoch, come over here. Look how I made this flower. See how this flower follows the sun. And oh, look over here. Isn't this beautiful? And that they would share creation. They share life with one another. And they talked about inconsequential things because they were close. And I wait for for myself and for the people I love to get past the consequential things with God that he already knows that they need and begin to get into the fun things and the inconsequential things and just sharing life with him where the really intimate relationship begins. It's kind of like kids. Isn't life more than food? What if, what if your relationship with your kids always centered around them coming down and going, do I get to eat today? Now, some of you have heard that. I'm not trying to point fingers at anybody. But what if it was, it was are we going to be okay? Are you going to provide for me this week? What if their whole existence and relationship with you centered around chasing around just the things they needed to survive? Is that what you want from them? Oh. So think about our relationship with God. 
if, if, if it's taken up with us worrying about the stuff that God's already got, he's got that stuff, then we're missing out on the life being more than food. Isn't life more than just about food? So if we're not supposed to be chasing after food, what are we chasing after? So Jesus answers that in verse 33, and it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Look, all these things that, that we're worried about, God's got it. He promises us that he does. So if I spend my time seeking two things, his kingdom, seeking his kingdom, and that's what we've been talking about is, is kingdom thinking and walking in, in the obedience to Christ and bringing our life into seeing things the way he sees them and, and, and letting him massage our life and bring us around to living life with kingdom principles. And the other thing is his righteousness, meaning his, the right relationship with him. If we focus in on being close to Jesus and having good relationship with him, having intimate relationship with him and, and looking to him day to day, you don't have to worry about all that other stuff. You know, there's this, if your problems, if this represents your problems, I'm not sure why the Bible would do that, but if this represents your problems and you're, and you're holding your problems like this all the time, that's all you see. But if you take your eyes off of this and put them on Jesus, do you still have problems? Yeah, but you know what? All of these things begin to fade in the glory of looking at him and knowing that he's got you and knowing his provision for you and, and walking. You can have the same issues, but it changes the whole circumstance if you're walking in peace and you're walking in joy and you're walking in hope that God's going to move in your life instead of walking in doubt and walking in fear, and walking in worry. So obviously these worries are not just about money or food or clothes, but there, it's, just, it's not hard if you want to find content to worry about. You just turn on the TV, and it's right there. Right? There's all kinds of things we're worried about. Worried, there's, you could worry about your family. Like, like this is a target-rich environment. Right? Like there's just a lot of things that are available for you to worry about, that are legitimate things. It's hard not to be concerned. There's some really hard things happening out there that hit pretty hard and close to home. World politics, wars. But really the answer for all of their worry, no matter where it comes from or where it is, 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 is the, this question. Is that something that I can trust God with? And I think it's important to ask this question because sometimes when you first view these things that seem like really big world-shaking things, that's not where you go to immediately. But if it's causing you worry and anxiety and stress, ask the question, is that something that I can trust God with? And don't, I'm not being facetious. I'm like, honestly, ask the question and, and process that. And say, is this something that, that, that I can trust him with? Is this something that, that God's worried about? You know, it's, it's easy to question the answer sometime and, and process. I think in the, in the process of asking yourself that question, you begin to realize that, yeah, I can. Even though that's different than the things I normally trust God with, I can trust him with that. But... Again, when you, when you make a decision to trust him, that's making a decision. That's a decision point in your day. And when you say, I'm going to trust you, that means you're giving him the thing you're trusting him about. And we don't like to do that sometimes. Especially when it comes to the things that really bother us that are going on in our nation and in our world. So I want to close with this. Um, there's this really great scripture about uh, in, in Mark. I didn't write down the, the chapter, but um, you guys remember the story. It's, it's the father comes and he brings his son to Jesus. And this is a great example of being Father's Day. And his son was possessed by a demon. 
And, um, and, and the father was worried for his son, and, and the son couldn't speak. He would get thrown down on the ground and have seizures. Um, the spirit would throw him into the fire and throw him into the water, trying to kill him. Think about the, if that was your kid. Wouldn't that just, wouldn't that be a burden on your heart, right? You would worry about him, right? So you can only imagine um, how worried this man was for his, for his son. And he needed an answer, and Jesus asked him to bring the boy to him. And the man said to Jesus, But if you can do anything about this, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus' response was, If you can? Everything is possible for one who believes. And this, this man's response is amazing and, and, and it's sort of a life sign for me. It's like the, one of those things I guide my life by. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me to overcome my unbelief. And I love that that is an okay answer. That that's an okay answer. Doesn't it show how much God loves us that that's a good response to him? And that's where I'm at sometimes. Because it's easy to recognize that, yeah, some of this worry in my life, it does hinder my walk with the Lord. It does hinder me from walking in the freedom and the fullness of what God has for me. But I'm just not there where I can just throw that yoke off and, and dance into the field of daisies. It's not where I'm at sometimes. But sometimes I pray this prayer, Lord, I trust you. Help me to trust you more. Nurture that seed of trust that you have for the Lord and help him to walk you into a greater trust of him. He'll answer that prayer. He'll do things in your life that will nurture that trust and he'll prove himself faithful over and over and over again until you're like, my trust is more than it used to be. So, so sometimes my trust, my response to the Lord is, Lord, I trust you. When, he, when I say, Lord, I'm worried about this. And he says, Joe, do you trust me? If it's, a, if it's something big that's going on in my life, it ha, if it has to do with my kids, if it has to do with things that are really important to me, sometimes my response is, Lord, I trust you. Help me to trust you more. Amen? And that's an okay response. That's where the grace of God is at in this, so. Lord, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for your desire to bless us, Lord. And thank you that we can cast off these things on you and that we can walk in the freedoms that you give us, Lord. Uh, help us to do that more. Help us to trust you more. Grow us in that faith and in that trust in our relationship with you. Thank you that you're faithful, that you're patient, that you're kind, that you never push us along, Lord, but you're just waiting and patient and you know how to grow good plants, Lord. So do that in our life. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Love you guys.